be back to the conference. It's been a wonderful conference so far. I'm going to today present part of my PhD project. Uh, my PhD project is on sky in the Western Isles. I look at all of the material in the sky of the Western Isles. And I'm looking at the centuries from eight, uh, 9th century to 13th century, which is quite a large span of time and material. So for this presentation, I thought that I would take a case study looking at two of the islands in my area of study, Lewis and South Uist, with a particular focus on the 11th century material. So for a quick introduction to my orientation to my area of study, this is Sky the Western Isles, located off the northwest coast of Scotland. And the major island here is Sky, and then this is Lewis, Harris, and North South Uist. Those are the major islands. And the, this chain of islands here is called the Outer Hebrides or the Western Isles. I may use them interchangeably. For this presentation, I'm going to focus exclusively on Lewis and uh, South Uist to compare the material in Lewis. For a quick chronology, because the Viking Age has different chronology country to country, the later, before the Viking Age is the later Iron Age, or, or the Pictish Iron Age, between the 400 and 800 AD, which it's a bit of a debate whether these people could be called Picts, but for simplicity's sake, I will just refer to them as Picts. Then, of course, you get the Viking Age, which begins with the first raids in the Irish Sea, and ends 1079 with the formation of the Kingdom of the Isles, which is based in the Isle of Man. Afterwards, you get the Late Norse period, which runs from the Kingdom of the Isles uh, to the Treaty of Perth, which is the result of the war between the Norwegian and the Scottish uh, kingdoms, where the islands are returned to the Scottish crown. And afterwards, you get the early medieval period, uh, which is called the Gaelic Renaissance, because that is when, at least from the circle sources, Gaelic culture returns to the islands and the Norse are displaced. As you noted, that this chronology is entirely based on the circle sources and archaeology. So before I begin with the Viking Age landscape, I want to discuss briefly the pre-Viking Age landscape. <coughs> so the Pictish period is defined by subterranean, single-skinned, uh, stone-foundationed roundhouses, such as this one illustrated here. And the burials before Christianization would be square curtains, such as that, or kissed burials. And then they also occupy earlier monuments, such as rocks and dunes, which were built around the first century AD, but are reoccupied at various different times. Christianization is likely at this point due to the presence of monastic communities. We know through historical sources and some place name data and some sculptural evidence. And of course, the Celtic language is spoken in the Isles. However, after the Pictish period, we have a complete change in the landscape. The Norse, we know from historical sources, come around the late 8th century, and you get a complete abandonment of the Pictish period, uh, Pictish settlement sites. There's a complete end to the picture settlement sites around late 8th, early 9th century, as far as we can tell through quite limited data. And the longhouses are, the houses now are longhouses as they would have been built in Norway. You also get a return of paganism with furnished uh, pagan graves of both male and female graves. And then from the placing data, we have the Norse language coming in. The placing situation in Scotland and Western Isles, as well as Northern Scotland as a whole, is quite unique in the sense that Old Norse is the oldest stratum of place names, besides some exceptions. That means that the Old Norse language completely eradicated the Celtic language. And there are some pre Norse Celtic place names, mostly in the outfields, so in the heatlands and the peatlands and hills. This has been interpreted by Bob Crawford to mean that there's some Pictish survival in the outfield. And Old Norse place names also include besides settlement sites, uh, law such as land ownership, assembly places, and religious Cel uh, pagan Celtic, cultic sites. This has been traditionally thought to mean, in scholarship, two things, either war or peace. Generally, place name scholars lean towards the war situation due to the unique uniqueness of the place name situation. Whereas the Picts were ethnically cleansed from Scotland. They were driven off, they were killed, uh, ones that were kept around were enslaved. However, there's also some scholars, particularly archaeologists, who argue for assimilation, hybridization, or acculturation. One example of acculturation that's been touted a bit is Norse pottery. So the Norse world, particularly Western Norway, is largely acoramic. They use soapstone, and there's actually a soapstone industry where of quarrying and producing soapstone vessels. However, in the Western Isles, while you have soapstone, is predominantly pottery, and the pottery is actually constructed with the same technique as the pre-Norse pottery. However, the style of the shape of the vessels are actually 
in what you would find in Western Norway to stop stuff. So my research question for this presentation is, what can the 10th to 12th century landscape reveal about the city in the sky in the Western Isles? Methodology, I'm going to use two case studies, Lewis and South Uist. I'm going to look at landscape, topography, geography, uh, place names. I'm not a placing specialist at all. I worked with placing specialists, but I, I'm a linguist, nor do I know Old Norse or, or Gaelic, so it's actually quite difficult. Excavation and survey reports, of course, and I'm going to compare 11th century Norse houses, which are only a handful, but they are quite significant. So with South Uist, South Uist has probably the best data for settlement sites. It was surveyed in the 1990s by Cardiff University, and it was revealed that there are at least, through erosion and rabbit damage, 24 summit mounds along the western coast of South Uist. Uh, the western coast is marked by a uh, topographical feature called Makar, which is <coughs> sand with grass covering. So you have these grassy plains. It's highly fertile, and, but also very fragile. It requires a lot of management. And we know that in the Pictish period, as well as the Norse and beyond the Norse period, this landscape was heavily cultivated to the point where there was a collapse of fertility around the 15th century. So it's not surprised, it's not surprised that the Norse landscape generally focuses on this Makar plain. And I'm going to discuss two settlement sites. One is here, called Bornesh. It's at the only natural sheltered harbor on South Uist. And the other is called Kilfadar. It's down here. So I'll discuss first uh, Bornesh. Bornesh is a Viking Age. Uh, it's been identified as an elite settlement site. There's quite a significant uh, Viking Age hall. But what's interesting is it will let it, the chronology is from the mid 10th to the 14th century, so quite a lot of continuity. However, the excavators have noted that the architectural style of this longhouse, even though it is a still a longhouse, it's still a Viking longhouse, the wall is single skinned, unlike double skinned Norse houses, and the house is semi subterranean. So it's built very similar to a pre Norse structure. It's actually called the Hebridean Longhouse because there are other examples. And we have another settlement site called Kilfadar, which is for the south. And again, it is a it dates from about mid 10th to 13th century. And what's interesting about this is again, it's a single skinned, as you can see, subterranean uh, longhouse. But the excavator Mike Parker Pearson has noted that in the vicinity, about 20 meters away from the settlement site, is a Pictish cairn that's also excavated. And he noted that the wall of this cairn is very similar to the wall, walls of the longhouse, which possibly has some implications for the view of the ancestors. I will briefly discuss some artifacts, which are Tibet's crosses, from both uh, Bornish and Kilfadar. It's worth to note that while they did find 24 settlement sites along the western coast of uh, South Uist, they did not find one burial. And there are various interpretations for that. There should be pagan burials. However, one interpretation is that, well, perhaps since we have a mid to late 10th century date on these longhouses, perhaps these people are already Christian and or Christianized. And one example of, um, of evidence is these bone crosses from Kilfadar, as from the earliest levels of the longhouse. And also at Bornesh, there are some crosses or possibly Thor's hammers, again, from the earliest levels. And so it's been interpreted by Neil Sharples that the people settling Bornesh and Kilfadar are already Christian or Christianized. Now, on to Lewis. Lewis is characterized, again, by a Makar plain along its, uh, mostly its western coast, or eastern coast. Uh, it has, it's punctuated, it looks, it's punctuated by quite a few natural sheltered harbors. Oops. Particularly where the modern day uh, city, if you can call it that, in, on Lewis, of uh, Stornoway is. And it's also where the famous Lewis chessmen have come from from the 12th century. So one site I want to talk about in particular is called Barbus. It was excavated very, it's a, key, a keyhole excavation mostly on the northwest coast of Lewis. And what's interesting about Barbus is that it's very similar to Kilfadar. They're both uh, moderate, not too rich um, settlement sites, but also they're, they have a similar function as well. They're probably secondary sites and not the main settlement site. But Barbus has a double skinned wall. It's not subterranean, even though it dates from the same time period and has a similar function. So it cannot be called the Hebridean longhouse. It's more longhouse like a Norwegian longhouse, but with a stone foundation. There's also a further example, but that excavation has been published yet, where you do another on Lewis, another, another double skinned longhouse. I want to briefly discuss a pagan cemetery on uh, Lewis. What my point here I wanted to express is that 
you have a cemetery of seven individuals, and including one very high status female burial, buried with uh, Hiberno Norse artifacts such as this ring pin and these belt fittings. And this is from, dated to the late, the mid to late 10th century. So whereas in, at Bornesh and Kilfadar we have some kind of Christianization early on, there's definitely still some kind of paganism being expressed. And there's also a further late to mid to late 10th century burial found about two kilometers to the west that was recorded in the 19th, early 20th century. Again, showing actually Hiberno Norse artifacts such as this belt buckle and Irish bridge actually. So briefly I want to discuss, there's St. There's Olive's Church in Lewis. I want to bring this up because I tried looking for St. Olive in the Hebrides. All we found, St. Olive is of course the patron saint of Norway. And after his martyrdom in the 11th, 11th century, his cult spread throughout Norway into, into Shetland and Orkney. However, it does seem to have come to Lewis. And we have no date on this church, but the dedication does suggest 11th to 13th century date. And this suggests a close connection with Norwegian cult, uh, cult of saint practices. We also have some data from Schielings from a recent paper by Foster, where he looked at the place name data of the Schielings. And he found two different place names visiting Schielings. One is Sater in green, which is entirely Old Norse. And the other is Argi, which is an Old Norse word, but is, is first a Gaelic word. And what he did was he looked at not only the place names, but the to topography and the soil, soil conditions of the sites where the place names are. And he, he found that Sater is better for beef cattle, cattle raised for beef, while Argi is raised uh, is better for milk cattle. And the formal evidence from the settlement sites also suggests this, because on Lewis, the settlement sites tend, you tend to have more beef cattle than milk cattle, whereas on South Lewis, you have more milk, uh, um, milk cattle than beef. And uh, what I've noticed myself is that there's clear, a clear distinction between Lewis and South Lewis in terms of Lewis has a satyr or the pure Norse with perhaps one uh, Agi site, whereas South Lewis has exclusively Argi sites. Again, place name evidence is tricky, but does, even though it's tricky, there's still a clear distinction here. So perhaps when um, I mentioned before, Bob Crawford has said that there's perhaps a picture survival in the outfield, shillings are in the outfield. So perhaps that's what we, we're seeing on South Lewis, for example. So to briefly mention the historical sources, because I'm not a historian either, but I thought I found very interesting that in the historical sources, there, even though we have the kingdom of the Isles, based in man, there is mention of different dynasties who rule different parts of the islands. For example, Lewis and Harris is thought to be, have been ruled by a Hiberno Norse or Norse clan, whereas South Uist, uh, Uist, the Uist, are ruled by a Gaelic clan. And I thought that, I think that perhaps we see this discrepancy in our archaeological culture as well. So to briefly discuss to compare the two, on Lewis, you have double-skinned longhouses, at least two of them. Uh, in South Lewis, Hebridean longhouse, two sites, multiple longhouses. On Lewis, 85% of the place names are Old Norse, whereas on South Lewis, only 30% of the place names are Old Norse. But it should be noted that wherever you have an Old Norse settlement site on, on South Lewis, you have an Old Norse uh, place name for a farm. Now you have, for example, more toward, it is more intensity towards beef cattle on Lewis, whereas you have more dairy cattle on, on South Lewis. You have late pagan burials on, on Lewis. It doesn't mean there aren't any pagan burials in South Lewis that have been found. But we do have evidence of likely Christianization, early Christianization. We have a St. Olive Church. There might be more salt ale, Olive Churches I haven't found yet, but that's the one we found thus far. And then we have, from historical sources, controlled by Norse or Hapar Norse elites. And in South Lewis, you have Gaelic or likely Gil Norse elites. One theory I have on why this is is due to geography and sea routes. The Isle of Lewis is notorious for being very difficult to navigate. The Butt of Lewis, which is right here, is considered to be, I'm not a sailor either, but from what I've discussed with local sailors, you do not want to try to attempt to cross the Butt of Lewis because of swells and heavy winds and particular weather. The most likely sea route would be stopping over at Stornoway, which is Old Norse for Steering Bay, and then heading southwest through the Sound of Harris, up and to get to where most of the Viking Age cinema sites and burials are on the northwest coast. I think that perhaps due to this, I don't think that uh, Lewis was isolated. I do think that it was easily controllable. So I think that the elites had taken control of the safe harbors and the sea routes, which perhaps led to a different 
more Norse identity. Whereas South Uist is a bit of a puzzle because there's only one natural sheltered harbor, but South Uist, perhaps due to its proximity to, into the Irish Sea, perhaps it's, you have more of a asymmetrical ethnic situation caused by this geography. So I, in conclusion, I, perhaps we have, we're looking at some kind of Gaelic survival or Gaelic, or Gaelic migration that is asymmetrical. So perhaps South Uist was subjected to less Norse settlement and then more and faster Gaelic resettlement compared to Lewis. I do think that we're looking at landscape of power and ethnicity, especially if we consider the Gaelic words are in the outfield. Perhaps the, the, uh, the Picts were reduced to a slave class, which has been suggested by many, and kept in the outfield at potters and, and tending the animals, while the Norse elites are in the infield. He perhaps do have two cultural zones, one more Norse, one more Gaelic. However, I do think that Norse culture is still dominant throughout the Hebrides. And even though South U.S. perhaps has some inflections of Gaelic culture, they're still likely speaking Norse. They're still building Norse longhouses long after uh, mainland Norway stops building longhouses. And you do have, of course, in Lewis, you also have Hebridean pottery, suggesting you have some survival picks as well. I do think that then, therefore, the elves do have their own distinct culture identity as a whole. Thank you.